Good morning, Sabbath School. I want to welcome those of you who are here bright and early today. It's always good to see your faces. <clears throat> One face that we are missing today is Kelly. Kelly usually is right here on the front row, keeping tabs of what's going on, engaging. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Kelly had a mishap, had a couple of falls, broke some ribs, and he's up, I believe, in Kaiser in a rehab location up there. I spoke with him last week, and um, George Nielsen drove up there this week and visited with him, and Kelly is still pushing ahead, uh, still talking about Jesus, and um, is his good self. So we want to keep him in our prayers that he will be restored to us. I believe he's trying to get transferred down here to the VA, one of the VA uh, facilities over here in Lebanon. So it'd be nice to have him closer uh, than up in Kaiser, because that's a little bit of a trek. Okay, well, before we begin our Sabbath school, I'd like to ask you to bow your heads and let's have prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for Sabbath. We thank you that you've blessed us. We thank you for the blossoms that we see on the trees, telling us that spring is soon to be here. We also thank you for the gentle showers that are watering the earth. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to please bless us as we consider your word today. And we thank you for hearing this prayer. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get into the lesson, I just want to bring in a couple of other things to your attention that I thought was interesting. <clears throat> Time has a way of moving on. And <clears throat> I noticed this week that a gentleman by the name of Dick Higgins, Dick Higgins passed away. Dick Higgins is one of the very, very few, maybe almost the only still surviving, living individual who experienced Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> he uh, is an Oregonian, and he lived up in Bend, Oregon. He passed away at the age of 102. 102. <clears throat> It's always interesting to talk with people who were there and to hear their perspective. Unfortunately, of course, that experience is going to become no longer an option for us as some of these old vets go to their rest. Another item that came across my feed this week that I thought was interesting that I would bring to your attention. Most of us have heard of the Hubble telescope. I forget exactly when that telescope was put up in space, but it was probably at least 20 years ago. And it has been the foundation for a lot of research in terms of what's out there. About, I think, two years ago, three years ago, a new telescope was put up. It's called the James Webb Telescope. And they, I can't tell you exactly how many times more powerful it is, but it is able to look even further into space. Now, most of us have heard of the concept of the Big Bang. And one of the things that's, that is um, central to the concept of the Big Bang is that the Big Bang occurred at a point in time. We don't know exactly when, but somewhere back in time it supposedly occurred. And the, the goal of astronomers has been to be able to look back in or out into space and actually see when that happened. 
Again, that's kind of an interesting concept, you know, see when that happened. Well, when the James Webb telescope went up into space, everybody says, oh, wow, we got a, a bigger, a bigger telescope, we'll be able to see further back into space and we'll be able to actually maybe begin to find, and again, think about this, this is kind of weird, but find the edge of the universe because there has to be somewhere an edge because it started with somewhere with a big bang. Well, this is an interesting concept, but I want to share something with you. I'm going to throw some numbers out here that are kind of going to blow your mind. So we have, excuse me, we, I should not include myself because I don't here. Um, the non-believing secular science community has calculated that the universe is about 14 billion years old. 14 billion years old. And part of that is supposedly supported with what is understood in relationship to the universe and the size of the universe, etc. Well, the James Webb Telescope has provided new information and we have now concluded that instead of only 14 billion years old, the universe is really 26.7 billion years old. And this is the interesting thing. They are concluding that the evidence shows that there is no end to the universe. It goes on and on and on and on and on. And um, the writer of this article, who I can tell you is not a Christian, is struggling with the concept of an infinite universe, which might suggest that there is no beginning. And without a beginning, that would imply that there is no end. It's interesting what's going on out there. <clears throat> and again, it's interesting to think about what you and I will have opportunity to learn as we experience that universe that God has created. Um, <clears throat> it's a big universe, and um, we can enjoy it and be a part of that. Okay, our lesson this quarter, or this, uh, yeah, this quarter is focusing on the book of Psalms, and we're on lesson 12, and the title of our lesson this week is Worship that has no ends. Worship that has no ends. And the study begins with this verse. Psalms 116 verse 12 reads as follows. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? What does it mean to render? Give, okay, I like that, give. I'm sorry? Extract. Okay, interesting, I hadn't, what's that? Pay, ah, what's that? Let go of. Oh, okay. Um, I, I like to, I'll, I'll focus on the give and the pay. Okay. Um, in other words, is there an exchange taking place here? Yes. Okay. Um, the psalmist has what? What is he saying here? He has... 
benefited, he has received something. Now, why did he receive it? Because of God's goodness. Okay. Um, <clears throat> benefits. What does is, what is the word benefits imply? Ah, yeah. So these are positive things. These are positive things. And I'm going to imply, I'm, I'm going to assume here that what the psalmist is really saying <clears throat> is that these are things that have benefited him that he didn't expect to ever receive. Have you ever had that experience? Um, I'm trying to think of a, of a situation that I could share with you. Um, should be many. <laughs> um, you know, an, an example would be You hear store. Oh, okay. Yeah, here's one. Uh, somebody's working in a in a restaurant, and they provide the service that they're expected to provide. They're just doing that. That's their job. And uh, part of the equation in the social construct here is is that they're going to get a what? A tip. Okay. Yeah, okay. How much of a tip? Well, maybe we'll give them three bucks, maybe we'll give them five bucks. Ah, oh, if we're really generous, we'll give them 10 bucks maybe. And every once in a while, you read a story of somebody who received a tip for a thousand dollars. Yes, exactly. It, totally unexpected. It is a benefit that they received out of the blue, so to speak. And then Within that context, does this psalm, this statement here, make more sense? Because what, is it, what does it elicit from the person who has unexpectedly received this benefit? What's that? Way beyond anything they could have expected. <clears throat> and it elicits from them what? A, a response of appreciation. And so the psalmist is asking a question, what shall I, how can I respond in a way that really expresses my appreciation for what I received unexpectedly, um, in this case, from God? <clears throat> now, the quarterly <clears throat> also begins with... Let's see, how do we segue here into this? <clears throat> um, we're we're going to talk about worship, but it talks about individual worship versus corporate or congregational worship. And what is congregation is perceived as ideal worship. This does not mean that the prayer and praise of the individual in Israel assumes a secondary meaning. By contrast, the individual's worship of God feeds the communal worship with renewed praise. While in turn, individual worship develops its fullest potential in close relationship to the community. So, what is it saying here? Is individual worship important? Yes. Is congregational worship important? Yes, because individual worship enhances congregational worship and congregational worship enhances individual worship. Yes, thank you. Impossible to have. Okay. Okay.
Sure. Right. So individual worship, you're saying, is more important than congregation because without individual worship, congregational worship won't take place. It's foundation. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now, let me ask you a question. Yes. Jenkins trying to signal me to do something. Oh, yes. Oh. Yes. Correct. Remotely. Right. Okay. Sure. Right. Okay. Okay, Jeannie? Okay. Becomes a form instead of actual worship. Okay. Becomes a ritual. Okay. All right. That's good. Okay. Okay. Define worship. Okay, that's a very good question. Before we get there, George? Okay, so uh, uh, in, the, in the fireplace, a, a coal by itself gives out a little bit of warmth, but doesn't do a whole lot. If you add a, a wood to it and the fire begins to burn, more energy is put out and more light is, is uh, also put out. Um, so let me ask you this question then. Which is the easier to do? individual worship or corporate worship or congregational worship? Congregational, you can fake it. Okay. Let me ask you this question. Is it possible to be present in corporate worship and not worship? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> We're still waiting for a definition of worship. All right, so worship matters. What is worship? What is worship? Yeah, we can't use the word to define the word. <laughs> While I have being. Okay, so then the lesson transitions in Sunday, and we start talking about lifting, lift up your hands in the sanctuary. The sanctuary ref refers back to what? The, the tabernacle in the desert, okay? And um, 
let me ask you this question. Why was the, ta why was the sanctuary, why was the tabernacle important? Okay, yes, it is where, it was where God was, all right? So, <clears throat> now this is, George. Okay, it was the place where, where people could come to learn about God. Okay, now this was again in the lesson quarterly that I thought was interesting. It says the Israelites worshiped an invisible God. Now think about that for a minute. The Israelites worshipped an invisible God. We also worship an invisible God who could not be represented in the form of an image. Now, I thought the author was, it was interesting. It, the, the author said, it, it said, could not, not was not, but could not be represented in the form of an image. Why did he say could not instead of would not or should not? Because it may actually be that there is nothing that will actually contain who he is in a material form. The only way that he is manifest is by the way he operates. Now that's a different way to think because, you know, when, when Moses, Moses is up in Mount Sinai and he's interacting with God and Moses asks what question? He says, show me who you are. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing voices. I'm hearing, I'm having this conversation. All these, I'd like to see you. And what did God do? Number one, he didn't show himself because, okay. But he, he, he manifests himself by the per, kind of person that he is. So, the lesson makes this point. The sanctuary did two things. One, it reflected the glory of the Lord. Remember when, when Solomon's temple was, was dedicated? What happened? It was, it was filled with glory to the point where what? Everybody moved back. Okay. So it, it, it manifests the glory of God. But then the other, second thing, this is the second part. It provided a secure environment for sinful people to approach their holy God or a holy, a holy God. What's the key word there? What does the word secure mean to you? Safe. safe. That's exactly right. When your house is secure, you feel safe. So even though there was glory, Nevertheless, it was in that environment that what kind of people could come? Are you thankful for that? Yeah, exactly. Where sinful people could approach. And when we approach somebody, what, why do we approach them typically? To communicate, to learn to have dialogue. And again, uh, I've, I've used this illustration before that, that the sanctuary was, was a sandbox illustration of the plan of salvation, what God was doing for the sinful nation of Israel 
to help them grow and become the people that he wanted them to be. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then the last point that was made in this, in this statement here, this is, I believe, on Sunday. It says, this encounter, sinful individuals approaching a, 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 a glorified God. A, no, that's not a sign. A God of glory uh, in a secure environment was initiated by who? By God himself. Um, because Israel had no idea. I mean, <laughs> did Israel think they had a problem? <laughs> no. Do we think we have a problem? No, we're pretty good people. <laughs> Sometimes we, at least we like to convince ourselves that way. Yes, uh, Kathy. Uh, needed or wanted. Yeah, needed or wanted. Yeah. Sure. Exactly. Um, so the other question that I have on this here. Um, no. Okay. So then we'll move on here. Any other thoughts on this? So what is a blessing? <clears throat> What's that? Good health. Good health. Okay, I'll give you a point there. Yes. Um, yes. The fortitude to be able to realize something has happened. The fortitude to realize that something is happening. Good. Okay, something good is happening. Okay. Are you happy with all the blessings you've received? Yeah, have you ever been disappointed with a blessing you received? Oh, yes, isn't that interesting? Yeah, we could go down, we could tell many stories on that. <clears throat> so let me ask you a question. What's the, what's the opposite of a blessing? The event versus the perspective of the person who received whatever. Okay. Sure. Okay. So, and, and perspective can change over time. I mean, can you think of anybody in the Bible story of the Bible of somebody who received a curse that ended up being a great blessing. Joseph. Joseph. Yeah, exactly. Who else? Saul. Daniel. Daniel. Okay, Daniel. Yeah. Yes. Another one? No? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, oh, so you're, so the question you're asking is, was Daniel in that, who, who was responsible for why Daniel was in Babylon? Was it God or was it somebody else? <laughs> We're dead. Yeah. Perspective. How to look at the you know. So. So that's why he ended up, yeah. So, a 
Okay, so let's, let's look at this. Um, again, we're, we're, we're trying to t make some sense out of this within the context of worship. Worship is a response to things that have happened to us. Blessings, typically, is what elicits worship out of us. But it looks like we might have to change this and recognize that what we, what we see as a blessing in the moment could in fact be a great curse in the long run and vice versa. The disappointment or the curse or whatever in the moment could in the long run turn out to be a great blessing. Pam. Big C curse, okay. Okay. Small C curse and big C curse, yes. Okay. Okay. Yes, Jeannie. Sure. Okay. I think I think that's a very very important point and that is is that things may happen to us that in the moment certainly was not God's will. Certainly wasn't our will. But in fact God can use to help us grow, develop, um, end up in, in situations where he can, he can provide us with opportunities that otherwise maybe would not have happened. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, one of the things, I, I, I forget exactly how this is said, but something to this, of, to, to this and that is, <clears throat> there are there are, are always things to learn in every situation. That's where I think God comes into the equation. God can help us to see things that we wouldn't otherwise see if we allow, if we, if we didn't engage God. <clears throat> and the prayer, I think, oftentimes that we should be praying when, when we're dealing with a, quote, curse or a rough patch of road is, Lord, help me to figure out what what opportunities you're trying to teach me here or what lessons you're trying to learn because the sooner I learn that, the sooner we can get off this rough road and onto something else that's of more of better driving. Yes, George. Well, <laughs> okay, so now you're talking about curses versus consequences. All right. <clears throat> well, what do I want to say here in relationship to signing off here? Because I am being told that uh, time is running out. <clears throat> As I was doing my looking for pictures, I came across this picture. Somebody who's spending time with their Bible. And the caption for this picture was as follows. What a perfect heart looks like. Does that make sense to you? What does a perfect heart look like? Someone who is seeking to know God and engaging and worshiping in the moment. And um, I would encourage you to Take advantage of the opportunities to have individual worship and also recognize that as you do that, you will contribute to the worship that we experience here Sabbath by Sabbath. Worship as a group, corporate worship is important because it helps us also grow 
in our individual worship. And without worship, I believe it is not possible for us to grow spiritually. So let us pray. Father in heaven, we ask that you would help each one of us to better understand how to worship you. You have blessed us in so many ways. Sometimes disappointments have been difficult, but we thank you that you have turned those into learning experiences and help us to continue to grow day by day. Bless us as we worship you in the next hour. We pray in Jesus' name.